and true. People just pop in. I got a lot of uh, Erica coming. Good. People are just rolling on in. If you're rolling in at the hour, then uh, you might have missed our walk-up song, Gotta Have a Funky Good Time, uh, that Samira picked out for us. So uh, you'll have to wait for the recording uh, to listen to that song. Um, but thanks for picking that for us, Samira. Just really set some awesome tone. So as people are joining in, I'll go ahead and uh, kick it off. So uh, the first slide here um, shows us the typical agenda. So if you've been to Lean On before, this is old hat to you, but I always like to take a minute to explain what Lean On is all about. So the first five minutes, here I am explaining it. I'm Emily Bassett, and I'll get to introduce to you Command Master Chief Samira McBride today. I, I'll take a couple minutes to do that. And then I, Samira and I will go back and forth with uh, her presentation. I might ask her a few questions or look at the chat. If you've got some questions, I'll pose yours. During our preparation, she told me uh, there was no question uh, that she probably hadn't had experience uh, with in leadership. She has seen quite a bit and she's probably got a story for that. So I challenge you to ask just your toughest questions. I think she'll really um, inspire us in that way. Then as you all are well familiar, we do our little breakout sessions where you get to do kind of what Lean On's all about, connect and work on professional development. And you'll talk to a few others in, your, in this session, two or three other people for up to 10 minutes. And then we'll come back for a group sharing to see what happened, what we learned uh, from each other. And then come up, uh, we try to stop right on the hour. And if you uh, are able to uh, stick around, great. Otherwise we try to end right on the hour. And um, then if conversations get um, more uh, private, then we might just go ahead and stop the recording at that point. But welcome everyone, Matt, good to see you. Thanks for joining in. I see people are joining, mom, always good to see. MOE, mother of Emily, people joining in. Welcome everyone. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, this kind of tells you what Lean On Navy is all about. And um, just after I'm done with this little presentation, you'll select speaker view. Now you can log off at any time, please. No reason to uh, raise your hand or just go ahead and log off. I understand distractions come up and uh, really the secret sauce of this Engagement is your engagement. And so I uh, go ahead and be engaged. And if you can't, then uh, log off. And that's totally, totally fine. Just um, distractions come up. Actually, uh, we encourage chat, encourage you to talk to each other, um, either to me or to everyone or to someone that you want to um, connect with. And I uh, ask you to please stay on mute um, unless you have, uh, unless I call on you. I always like to put those websites up there, refer to Lean On Navy. Uh, that's where all these are hung and uh, join the conversation at Facebook um, or check out uh, as well the um, SSLA, which is the leadership organization um, that I'm the president of for all women uh, in the sea services in uniform. So that's what Lean On Navy is all about. And with that, I think the next slide has a photo. Is that right? Do I have that right? There we go. So look who I got to meet yesterday, All right. So there we were yesterday, uh, Samir McBride and I, we got to meet um, in person and uh, now she's back in Norfolk and I'm here in Seattle. But at the time we both were at the US Naval Academy yesterday uh, celebrating uh, Mick Pond, Russ Smith's um, change of office and his retirement. So that was us yesterday. Okay, thanks Vic, you can end slide there. Um, and with that, uh, what I would like to do is uh, just do a quick um, kind of warm up, kind of introduction to see people who are here and where they're from. Um, so if you are on the call and you have access to chat, to uh, if you are on your computer and have access to chat, um, just ask you to type in your location and maybe your profession. Just give a chance for us to uh, give a chance for our uh, guest, for Samira, to sort of know what the profession's professional perspective is of those people who are listening today. Um, and then, kind of for you, as you are in the audience, um, this part of this is connection is connection, right? So if you see someone who has a similar profession as yours or one that you're interested in learning more about. Um, you know, maybe that'll inspire you to, to chat with that person and share contact information um, if, that's, if that's interesting for you or something that you want to take from this call, because we are all about uh, professional development and connections, kind of why we're here. So uh, I see we're coming in from Springfield, uh, from Charleston, from uh, Naval Postgraduate School, um, my mom in Seattle, <laughs> uh, Newport in New Jersey. So, uh, and then visiting New York right now, uh, so great. So um, thanks everyone. And with that, I would like to introduce our guest. 
so Samira McBride, uh, CMC, Command Master Chief right now, and for those of you um, who might not know, that's a senior enlisted advisor uh, to the commanding officer at ATG Norfolk. That's the Afloat Training Group Norfolk, um, but not her first uh, rodeo, and uh, she's done this before, and in fact, what she did on the USS Gonzalez, she uh, won the, what we like to call the McPawn of the Year Award, um, also known as the Delbert Black um, Leadership Award. And uh, she was the first woman to ever win that award. So just rocking it. And that uh, some of you may know that uh, some of our past pre presenters um, have uh, served with her. We had a lot of people that know you uh, and it's a small world, right? So we have uh, Chris Schwartz on, on the call. He, he was our guest mentor uh, a few uh, times ago when we got to learn about not just mental health, but also mental hygiene. Um, and he shared his story and he's on the call. So he was her commanding officer. Uh, in one of uh, her toughest tours, the tour that actually got her elected, um, appointed this award. And that was when she was on USS Gonzalez. They had just come out of a, I'll let her tell the story, but just a really tough tour. So it came out of a, you know, a availability, which is like maintenance period, way late and had to do about 12 months in training in about a six month period, and then get out there and uh, deploy, deploy um, as a ballistic missile defense ship. And I uh, really worked together as a team to overcome all those challenges. And um, with that, I could turn it over, but there's much more I want to say. I want to say I got to meet her husband yesterday, who is also a command master chief, and that she just had a baby. If you went to the Joint Women's Leadership Symposium um, in July, you would have seen her on the stage. And it was literally the day before she gave birth to Ava. So she now has a baby born in July that... Uh, was not born maybe last time you might have seen her. So um, really just an honor and a pleasure uh, to see you with us today. So um, Samira, just over to you and look, really looking forward to you telling us your story. All right, Samira, we did our op test. So I now see you frozen, but you were literally working not seconds ago. So I see you frozen and I don't hear you. Um, at just the moment that it is to go, <laughs> despite all our operational tests before. Can you unmute and I see you uh, frozen. Let's see, but you're smiling. So your smile looks really good, Samira. I mean, if you're gonna be frozen, that's a great way to be frozen. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so Samira, I'll invite you maybe to maybe log off and come back on again and see if that helped you. Yep, look, that's exactly what she's doing. Uh, there are a lot of awkward ways that we could have been frozen, right? <laughs> if you're going to pick one, I hope I get frozen smiling too, if I find myself that way. <laughs> so it was really fun to see her yesterday in person. Um, I think you saw the photo that Vic just shared for us, um, but it's very rare that I, I get to meet you guys, meet all of you in person. Most of us are just Hollywood squares that we see. So now we are having a hard time getting her back. On. So I will uh, see if she can log back in and, uh, and join us shortly. Mm. I wonder if I want to pause the recording. Let's do that. Yeah, I think I lost connection there. All right. Well, welcome back. Thanks for, uh, for coming back in again. You look great and we hear you great. Okay. I'm just using my phone, right? I don't know what happened with the computer. Um, all right. So I'm on. You look great and we hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, you know, first I wanna say thank you, um, you know, Captain Bassett to, uh, for, and Lean, Lean on Navy for giving us the platform to come together and have these conversation and share experiences. Uh, I'm definitely humbled to be a part of this uh, conversation and for you to even contact me to know that my captain who was part of why I am who I am today, especially in this Navy um, came right before me a couple of weeks ago, I definitely, you know, I'm intimidated coming in, right? So looking at the list, I can't see it right now, but looking at the list of the audience, um, you know, I'm kind of shaking a little bit because it's not what I'm used to talking to young sailors and, you know, all Navy. So it's, you got some heavy hitters logging on. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Chad, Africa. So I was born in um, Kuseri, Cameroon. At the time, there was a nine month civil war going on in Chad. So I was born in a refugee camp. Um, in Chad, uh, in Cameroon, uh, nine months in, and then moved back to Chad. And here we are from there. My father, he's a, 
he is a uh, he works at the State Department at the U.S. Embassy in Chad. So he's still over there, 40 plus years, married to my mom. Uh, my siblings, you all of us have joined one way or another. So I have we we are a family of service, if that makes sense. So my my father, as I said, is at and at, at the State Department. My oldest sister is a warrant officer in the Marine Corps. Um, I have my sister Layla, who was the original one who joined. She was an IT in the Navy and got out after six years. And myself, I have two siblings, younger brothers in the Marine Corps. Um, my journey, especially as it pertains to service or the Navy started early as we saw at the US Embassy, the Marine security guards always did their, their thing on 4th of July. So we always wanted to join but we just didn't know which part. So I, jo I went actually to join the Marine Corps. They weren't there, they were at lunch. So the Navy pulled me in, gave me the exam. And next thing you know, I took the test. And, and so the rest of the story, um, I joined and I, and I enjoyed it. I started off as an OS. Um, and the reason why I stayed enlisted is, honestly, that you know most of my chain of command always wanted to push me to go officer and go officer, but some way I always wanted to be a command master chief. I wanted to challenge myself with that. One, it's not like you could get up and command master chief is handed to you. And secondly, I wanted to make sure that I didn't see me coming up. I didn't see a lot of me in, you know, in those senior ranks. And early on, I decided it may just have to be me. So it was just a goal. It, it, it didn't mean that it was gonna happen. I just felt like, you know, that's gonna be my path. And I, in my way, I've had a lot of great people to include, you know, Captain Schwartz. And I always talk about him every chance I get him, my cap, all my captains to include. Now I have a new one added, Captain Hayes, but Captain Glenn, Captain Schwartz, Captain Hayes. It takes for people who believe in you in order for you to be able to do any job and to continue to do it well and want to um, continue to serve. For our organization, for us to want to serve at a higher level in today's Navy, just speaking of the Navy is very challenging. We are in a very dynamic time, you know, um, on all levels, culturally, socially, even in the services. And today we're talking about inspiration and excellence in command or in leadership. For, for, for anyone to wanna do it in this time, you know, thank you, to include you, Cam um, Bassett, it, there's no other reason but for us to pay it forward because every day you go to work, there's something to keep that's keeping the fire. And it's not because it's, it's going to be a good day that day. Most times we go in, we're coming home drained, but we wake up the next day, we want to give it our best simply because we want to be walking examples for the next ones who are going to come behind us and continue with that torch and that legacy because at, at some point we're all going home. Um, so, you know, starting off as an OS, I, you know, chose to stay uh, a couple of years later, the ranks kept coming. And then I had, I was on a fleet CPO training team um, at fleet forces, but my, my true experience and growth came from, from the USS Gonzalez and being a part of a command triad or leading at the higher level. One, you have to have a strong command triad, which means the commanding officer, executive officer, and command master chief. We lucked out because my CEO was very competent and very proficient, but had enough confidence not to hinder myself or the executive officer because we all had our own energy. But everybody stayed in their lanes and we understood commander's intent and he supported us and we supported him. And that's what made the command successful. The trust, you know, the loyalty, and the, the times where, the, where it's tough to be able to close the door and have those hard talks. And when you walk away, you're still walking out as a team, not you know, as opponents. And that's the first thing that makes it you know, worthwhile. I wanna go right into um, Cam Bassett kind of talk to me about the most uncomfortable thing when you are in leadership, which is complaints that you get, you know, from your subordinates, i.e. IG complaints or you know, equal opportunity complaints, and how do you deal with those? Um, I will, I'll be lying if I sit up here and say, you know, my, my, my positions were always um, you know, comfortable or everybody loved me. I would be lying, right? Because although, although awards may come out of it, it's blood, sweat, and tears, but one thing I will tell you is be resolute 
And, it, you know, for myself is to be comfortable in your ability to lead because it's very uncomfortable. And not everybody is going to, when you're doing things right, not everybody is going to buy into it. And not everybody is going to, you know, to be a supporter. But we always preach, do the right thing. And those who are always having a problem with it are those who understand that, you know, the right thing is the way we, we have to move. But instead, they're the ones giving you the most headaches because doing the right thing is the hardest part of leadership. And if you want to be consistent and you want to lead um, your troops in a manner to where procedural compliance is met, good order and discipline is met, the standards are met, and, and excellence is at the top, you, you're not going to be loved all the time. Um, but it is important to remain aware of the reasons behind each decision we make in the workplace and, you know, and the way we treat our people. If you start and stop with that, when these complaints come, you don't have anything to worry about because, and what I always told my CEOs is just do the, do the right thing, due process will take care of itself. Right, so your loyalty is to the right thing, not to me. And if it's my name on it, I, I always support my commanding officers in investigating it, doing, you know, whether they wanna assign and investigate an officer, whether it's that IG complaint, let the process do its part. And at the end, you know, we will still be here strong because I'm not that master chief. But you have to be, in order for you to, to have that, mindset you have to be in tune with who you are and um i don't i would never compromise my character and my integrity for anyone or for anything or for a position for nothing i i stand for me first and i stand on a lot of people's shoulders to start with my family name so the navy doesn't define me i feel like i define my uniform Therefore, I'm not moved by anyone or anything, and I'm not going to do anything out of line just for fame or for likes or for loyalty. And no one myself gives me confidence. And in order for your leadership to trust you, when you say that wasn't me, they're putting their, their careers on the line also. So you don't want anyone to, to, you, to risk what they work hard for, for you, if you are not doing the right thing. So to no, me, I that's, that's, Samara, and I'll just yeah. interrupt because I remember this, you gave me a great example of that, which I've, you know, kind of even since our conversation been thinking about, which is, you know, someone did submit a complaint against you and you were just upfront with it. You just read it and you said, okay. And but you kind of knew that you had done the right thing. So you just trusted the process to hold out and you just, you were able just to keep what you're saying in, in context. Right. Because my attitude towards anyone complaining put in a complaint, you know, towards me in any fashion is that, I mean, you could have just talked to me about it. And if, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I mean, I'm a command master chief, so I'm not supposed to be in that position if I'm out here doing bad things. I'm not supposed to be, you know, anyone's command master chief in this Navy. It's time for me to go home. So do the right thing, meaning that even if I'm wrong, instead of going to file a complaint, go talk to the commanding officer about it, right? Because we all work for somebody. And if you wait and go behind the paper and, you know, because, because in the paper, you could write whatever you want, but be, make sure you can validate it because when we both come to the line, make sure we have our story straight. So in that case, I always, I don't wake up every day to try to do wrong by anyone, right? Because that's not, the job is hard enough. So I can't track all the wrongs I want to do. But if I wake up and I just want to do my part, my intentions are never malicious or to ruin someone's career. It's to make them better. And I can validate that providing that I'm not crossing any lines. But in my position, when I do wrong, I'm putting my commanding officer at risk. And that's a burden I will never take. They work too hard to get to where they're at. And it's lonelier in, his, in their seat than it is in mine. So I refuse to do something to, you know, to risk all of their hard work and dedication, food they put in on the table for their families, because I wanna be selfish running around doing what I wanna do. Impossible. So I always felt like um, if I know, and I, on top of it, I know what I'm doing, right? So if I did wrong, I'm gonna tell on myself before because I already know I crossed the line. 
and I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the the responsibility and whatever comes with it. But always, 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 always make sure I, I made sure that I took care of those around me. And if there was anyone that was gonna take the fall, it was gonna be me. That's how I and, moved. And can you talk about how you knew what the right thing to do uh, by the US Navy standard was when like how you defined your character when you, you know, found yourself coming to the you know the US US late in life and you had to learn all the time, I assume, like what what the right thing by the means of this organization was. <laughs> I think it was easy because the UCMJ I have at home is stronger than the UCMJ in the Navy. So I was, I wasn't, it, I thought it, I thought it was an easy fit. The Navy is easier. Actually. So, you know, because growing up, everything is, is honor, 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 the name, the honor, you can't discredit the family name. You can't dishonor the family, you know, it's, uh, the name, the, it's always that. So, and you never want to be the first one to come. So I left home. I joined the service. I was supposed to go to college and you know do all of these things, but we all, all of myself and my sibling, siblings defied it because we wanted to see if we could stand on, on, on our own two feet. And so by joining, we had a lot to prove because we already went against, right? So now to me, it was one, I had a purpose. I didn't come to play. I came to, to work, to figure me out, to do something for myself and to make my family proud. And then on top of that, um, when, you, when you know who you are, you know your identity, you're not seeking belonging with anyone or anywhere. This is a job for me. It's, it's not my livelihood, right? It's easier for you to stand tall. And the right thing, everybody knows the right thing. We just choose not to do the right thing. Um, but if you, in the military, it's all in the black and white. We know the lines we can cross. It's all in policy and 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 uh, instructions. We know the lines we can't cross, and we know that you have to be read and you have to be aware. And if I'm not read and aware, and I call myself somebody CMC, I'm wrong. I'm supposed to be ahead of all of those things so that I can set the command up for success and meet commander's intent, and then in turn meet the mission, so that we can be successful because that's what we get called to do. Right. Right. Well, uh, see, anyone else have any questions that they want to ask? Uh, something that's coming up from your leadership experience. The other things I asked uh, Samira to talk about was uh, what inspires you? Like what is, you know, there were some people in the audience who had said, um, gosh, I don't know if I want command. You know, it's lonely. Oh, Vic, go ahead. You have a question. Let me go ahead and ask you. Uh, it's it's not so much as a question, but a thank you, um, because I, I love that you started off with how how do you deal with um, people reporting you? And I, I got to say um, that happened to me when I was the director um, of NSA Hawaii uh, into personnel. And it really hurt my feelings. I mean, it really hurt my feelings. And um, it turns out this particular person was kind of a prolific reporter. And so, um, you know, by reporting, by bringing me into the mess, they're like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's enough's enough. But it was, it, it was just so um, flooring. That, and I remember my CO pulled me aside and said, you know what, Vic, if you're going to continue doing this, just get used to it. Just get used to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, I mean, it's, it's just, it's too bad that that is um, the way that it is, but it's also about um, how we internalize things. And so I appreciate you talking about, you know, you just took it, you ran with it and you just, it's matter of factly just, you know, went on with it. But for me, it was just a much more uh, emotional experience. So I, I appreciate your, the way that you handled that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will tell you, well, it's, it's good and bad that he's online, but I'll tell you this. When, for me, when, when a lot of the major complaints were coming, we were at a point where I couldn't have my captain focused on me and these allegations because there was decisions, there was life and death decisions that this man was making. The last thing I wanted him to focus on was me being worried about doing the wrong thing. And so there was many times where I'll go in there and get my business, right? And I call it the business because it's like CMC yet again, yet again. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, but I had to show strength because I didn't want them to see me sweating. 
But when I went down to my office and I shut it down, there was plenty of times where I was second guessing myself, like, could I be doing something? Like, how is it that this is happening with my name on it? Where, what am I missing here? But when I opened the door, I had to put on the face because one, if it was not all legit, I didn't want them to think that that's the easy way where you get leadership off the seat. And on the flip side, I also didn't want my commanding officer to be concerned about me and my well-being and my sanity while we were out there doing, doing God's work. And, but I could also sleep good at night because he had my back. And by, by him having my back doesn't mean turning the blind eye. No, it's just, we're going to look at a throw and we're going to do the right thing by everyone. But, you know, I, I always say people like me are not meant to make it. And, I, and by that, I mean, you know, it's easy to stand out. And when people don't want to see you succeed or continue, the easiest way is to come up with this kind of stuff. If you don't have leadership who believes in you and believes in your, the good you do and also your character, then he could have sacked me easy. He could have easily said, you know, loss of confidence. And that's all it takes, you know. But that gave me even more... Um, it motivated me more to, to, to up my, my doing the right thing. And I, I couldn't put a, a dent on anything. Everything I did, I looked at it harder because I definitely didn't want to let him down because he put a lot on the line to, to, um, to trust that I wasn't doing those things. And I wasn't the, the discredit at the command or for the Navy. No, and then to like turn around and come back. And then they put me in for an award for leadership. It was unbelievable. To this day, I get goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, that was like the trust and the loyalty that you talked about kind of being part of your character. Lori, I see you had your hand up, but then it came down. I, maybe we didn't call on you soon enough, so I apologize about that. No, that's okay. Well, it was. I, I think it was probably kind of along the same line, but it was coming from a certain perspective. So I'm, I'm guessing that it along the way in your career, um, because you're so driven, right, and clearly so capable and competent, that you've probably been in some situations where some some male peers are frankly kind of threatened by you, and and when that happens, they will sometimes take actions, right, that are either obvious or subtle to try to to try to either knock you off your game or badmouth you or you know intentionally leave you out of meetings or not send you the email that you should have gotten. Um, and I'm just wondering how you dealt with that if you you know discovered that that was happening. Well, I'll give you an example. There was a. One time there was a complaint that, well, it was it written in the surveys, not in voice, but that I was coming out of my executive office. So I'm a female, he's a male, um, out of my executive officer's um, stateroom at midnight, right? So, so, you know, to me, I was looking at it like, okay, so now we're just going to get disrespectful, right? So it's one thing if you think I'm not fit to lead, it's another if you're coming from for me as a woman, as in, in my character. But that's how I decipher the validity of these complaints, right? So I'm not, if, and, I, and I think I told my CEO, I said, you know, sir, if I wasn't a female, that comment wouldn't be written. Because a male could come out of that room all day, nothing would happen. And even if I was there at midnight or not, I couldn't remember. But it, it was that as a strictly female, you know, hit. But I'll be honest with you, um, I, I don't. I don't put too much on those things because I know who I am, right? And I know that it comes with the territory. Is it unfair? Is it uncomfortable? Yes. But me knowing that makes me get ahead of it so that when it, when it happens, I deal with it with grace. And I think that hurts, hurts whoever the culprit is. It hurts them more than me giving them the time of day and entertaining those things. Um, because because I'm coming to work I don't have time for that but if you do fine but I just can't focus on that but does it hurt my feelings no do I wish I don't I didn't have to deal with that yes but until we get to the point where there's enough of us out here it's gonna happen and if it happens to me until it doesn't happen again I'm okay with that because at least I can handle it and that's 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 my attitude towards it I love it and Samira one of the things you said at the beginning of this was about Maybe sometimes at the end of the day being exhausted and then you get up and you keep going anyway. Um, I love that. There's that specific kind of exhaustion that I just love that is the exhaustion that comes from knowing you worked really, really hard at something that was really, really worthwhile, right? Mm -hmm. You're just like, okay, if you're going to bed tired, you know, you're doing a good job. You know, if you go to bed, not feeling tired, you're like, 
Did I give it my all today? Right. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but when you said that, it made me want to ask you, um, what what is it that keeps you going every day? You know, that makes you go look for maybe another CMC job, or that makes you look for more leadership opportunities. What is, as you look and say, where's my best fit in my future? What is it that keeps your fire going, or what is it that keeps you? Um, or do you sometimes go, maybe, maybe I'm not. Uh, what's your process? Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm done. Maybe this is enough for me. How do you know that for you? Um, I, I I look at it different. I look at it from from coming up from Chad to being here today. When I look at that journey. I don't, I see it to where it didn't have to be me. So now that it is me, I don't have the option, but not to wake up and give it my best, if that makes sense. Because there are too many, too many great people out here doing greater things, you know? But for some way, somehow I had the opportunity and I still have the opportunity to be a command master in the Navy, but more importantly, have the influence you have to give somebody a chance to be a better version of themselves. Because ultimately that's what we're doing in leadership. If you tend to do it right, I get to pay it forward. So to me, why not? Because it didn't have to be me. And so I don't take it lightly that I get to do it. And I get to be like CMC McBride. I don't take that lightly at all. So every time mm. I put my uniform on, I, I take it very seriously. And I moved in that fashion. And, and I just think that you know, th there's nothing more, more honorable to do at this point. Now, now that I have, you know, baby Ava, you know, I even have more, more reason to be the ultimate example because I have somebody who's watching me, not just somebody else's kid, which is all my sailors and everybody else that I'm running around trying to grow, but I have my own who's sitting at home watching mom move. So I have all the more reason to be the ultimate example. And if somebody could, it doesn't have to be everyone, but if one person can look at it and say, hey, that's what I've been missing, that's what it is. And I don't need to be it, but seeing that it exists, it gives me, um, it gives me some kind of courage to continue to do this and maybe meet that and exceed it, then, that, then I've done my job. I love it, I love it. Alma Richardson, sir, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Emily, and thanks for uh, the invitation to join everybody today. And uh, CMC McBride, I've got to tell you that uh, you are capping off what is an amazingly inspirational day for me, right? Oh my goodness, sir! Let me just let me just tell you that uh, I'm in uh, Chicago right now, and I'm giving a bunch of talks here. But one of the things that I got a chance to do again is visit a school here, which is a, a public high school, but a magnet school, the Hyman G. Rickover Naval Academy. And everybody in that school is a member of the uh, junior NROTC. So they all wear uniforms. And uh, today, you know, for our visit, they were all in their service dress blues. And uh, their stories are like yours, right? Their stories are like yours. In many cases, these students are the first in their family, the history of their family to graduate from high school. And in many cases, they travel an hour or more every morning to come to school and participate and then uh, do sports and everything. And then an hour back home. And then it's not unusual that they then go to work and then they do their homework and then they get a quick nap and then they're back on the bus or the train or the L to get back to school the next morning. Yes, they sir. come from every <laughs> possibly ethnic uh, background, right? Uh, they come from very, very uh, poor neighborhoods. And uh, just like you, there's not an ounce of uh, pity, self-pity or victimization or anything in their attitude. They are all amazingly positive. They are all just incredibly grateful for the opportunity that they have. They all are solid in their uh, sense of themselves, just like you are so solid in the sense of yourself. And they don't let these things bother them. They just, you know, just like you described, just water off your back. You just, you've got more important things to do. Uh, this is all about doing the right thing for you and your command and now your child. And so I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, uh, 
Uh, I'm just riding this wave of inspiration and now mm -hmm. you, you, it's going to crest with you. Uh, uh, but I'm going to take away from your conversation and your attitude and everything. I hope we can all just distill that and, and, and breathe it in uh, because we'll all be better people just by virtue of uh, you sharing your time with us. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I, I guess I didn't have a question after all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's so inspiring and exactly what we're seeing in, in Samira is there's just all humility and, and no victimization. And for you to say the UCMJ is what you have at home. I mean, that loyalty and that, that's just <laughs> awesome. You know, Erica, it's about I, standards, Emily. I just thought maybe I'll just, uh, you know, a lot of times in my history, there was, uh, when it comes to standards, there was, we would have discussions about action that we were taking and someone would say, well, look, you know, I didn't break the law. Right. Why am I, why are you taking this action? Uh, and, uh, you know, you would have to just communicate. Well, you know, we're an organization who stand, I mean, the law is just the lowest rung of the ladder, right? If you break the law, uh, you know, our standards are so much higher than that. Our expectations for uh, honorable behavior are so much higher than that. And, uh, you know, uh, Master Chief, what I get from you is that, you know, your personal standards are higher still, right? Exactly. And so when you see these challenges uh, in perspective, you've been through so much more already that uh, this is something you can handle with great grace and, uh, and effortlessly. So thanks for sharing your story. Thank you, sir. Love it. Now the hands are still coming up, so I'm, we're just going to go with them and maybe not do the breakout. <laughs> if this is good, then we'll go with it. Erica and, and Chris, I know you had to go, so uh, are you still going to be able to stay online? Or should I call on you? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and call on Chris because your hand was up, and then I'll come back to you, Erica, because I know Chris had to uh, take off here shortly. Are you, You're still muted. I know you're driving, though, so I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead. There you go. You're off mute. <laughs> Thanks, um, thanks, Emily. Yeah, I, I, I pulled over. Um, uh, and thanks, Admiral Richardson. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, add on to, uh, you know, one thing Samira didn't really talk about, and, you know, obviously we talked about these IGs, is her resiliency and toughness and holding people to a standard. And I think to Admiral Richardson's point, that's what separates her from most. And that's why she's recognized for this award. You know, the Gonzalez, when she got there, um, she had to form a, a tight knit crew that needed resiliency that was going to a seven month deployment in the middle of the Gulf, we would stay there. And if you remember, this is back in 2019 when uh, tensions were pretty high with Iran. And, uh, and that's, that's what she did. She formed a resilient, tough crew that was held to a standard. And so, uh, so anyway, I just want to say thank you. And, um, and that, that is the gold standard. Thanks. Love Chris, it. Were, were you the CEO? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry I came in just a little bit late. <clears throat> yes, sir, I was. All right, so all of the confidence and support and backup that uh, Master Chief was talking about, that came from you. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> And and a and a great and a great exo too, Commander Ray Glenn. He was yeah. We had a we had a really good team, yes sir. <clears throat> yeah. Ray well, Glenn, he's not my arrow. Yeah. Congratulations to you, Chris, and uh, <laughs> thanks so much for doing that. You know, you the three of you as a triad demonstrated just the amazing power of that self reinforcing. You know, where each of you is injecting each other with confidence to go forward and uh, and and really withstand some of the tearing down forces that are just, just out there. That's just part of our reality. So Chris, I just want to, uh, you know, pass on my, my very best uh, and gratitude and respect to you for everything you did to, to make this happen. And thank you, Admiral. And thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Erica, I'm gonna go ahead and call on you. Thanks for your patience. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to be able to attend today. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background about actually how I know Samira, and then I have a question for her. So I got to meet Samira because we were building the My Navy Coaching Initiative at Navy Personnel Command, and we need to pilot our content. And we had asked the chief of staff there at the Atlantic Forces, like, hey, 
Can you tell us who are some ships, other platforms that are really ahead of the game in terms of offering professional development among their crews? And so literally the Gonzalez, the ship that she was on at the time, was one of the ones that came out. They're like, you guys have got to go and see them. And so the Gonzalez is a destroyer, about 300 on board. And I have yet to see the level of commitment of that coming and try it at that time when I first met Samira in terms of how they were working with the sailors, the just interactions that they had with them, just like the feeling that you get when you walk into a place, you're like, oh, I really just don't feel comfortable versus like you walk in, you're like, yeah, this, this, this feels comfortable. Yeah, I like that. And so that's what we got and just their openness. And we went back and forth getting to know them probably for about 18 months in this process in terms of them helping us to really create a good product. We even went back and saw them for a second time. And I know leadership had turned over then and we got to pilot a little bit more and just the comments that the sailors had to say about how they felt that leadership listened to them. And the one thing I also want to share is that at that time too, I know that Commander Glenn was, he was the CO and he actually did all 300 midterm counselings for every single sailor on that ship. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people about development. And the one thing that always comes back and that you will never hear Samira say is the fact that, well, I don't have time to do that. And I've been told by so many leaders, and I use that as an example to say, if you're prioritizing development, then you're making the time to do it. So oh God, when I, love when that I share that, then it's just like, oh, because I, I really feel a lot of what Samira is talking about, people want a playbook for how to actually do the leadership and there is no playbook. It's only that experience and it's making those really hard decisions that make us uncomfortable. And I, and I love that being uncomfortable is a common theme that has come up in this conversation today, because it, it shows me that all of us are still growing regardless of what that leadership experience level is. So just want to say it's very good to see you, Samira. And now is my question for you. <laughs> and she's laughing because okay. she knows I ask hard questions sometimes. <laughs> uh, the question though is, you mentioned earlier about always being a better version of yourself and in your reflections of your prior leadership, what would you do differently to maintain being an even better reflection better. of yourself? Continue to grow. Um, continue to, to remember that, you know, I've not arrived. It's not about me. And that the, um, just to have the opportunity to continue to serve at a higher level in, in this organization, that um, to be reminded every day that my sole purpose is to pay it forward. Thank you. And that's what you're doing now today. I mean, even I could see your body language when Admiral Richardson came on. You're like, oh, here I go. I mean, this is you kind of leaning forward and you're paying it forward because you know all the people who are going to listen to this recording and people on the line right now. This is you, you know, making some uncomfortable decisions to make this time. You are away from Ava right now and you had a ceremony this morning. So it's not convenient. And like Erica's saying, you're prioritizing development. Everyone on this call that's taking the time, or everyone, everyone who's listening is taking time from everything else we could be doing to prioritize development and to grow and to be a better version of yourself. I love it. I love it. Love what you're doing. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Uh, hey, thanks, Emily. This is great. I, I love your uh, your uh, platform here. Uh, Samara, I got a question. Um, and you mentioned this earlier in, in a remark about you usually talk to the younger um, workforce. And I find that in a lot of organizations, that is, um, uh, I can't think of the word. Um, it's Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> neglected. Neglected. Uh, planting that seed for the younger for workforce to make those good decisions, that foundation for good decisions, Usually, you know, they get in trouble earlier, typically, I, I would say. So what do you do to encourage that environment? You mentioned learning. But what other frame or guardrails do you put out there to ensure the young workforce gets a good dose of discipline and making those right decisions uh, when they go, when they hit, hit that fork in the road that may be personal, may be professional? What, what, is, your, what is your style there? What, what do you do? Um. I mean, I, I intentionally make myself available and I intentionally make my chiefsmen available. 
Um, and, and the reason for that is, you know, I'll give you an example. When I was a, a, a senior chief, I, I went to, well, let me back it up a little bit. When I joined the Navy, right? This is a good question because it, it gets me emotional sometimes because, you know, I almost got kicked out of the Navy in boot camp. And the reason is because <laughs> when I joined, um, you know, I, as I said, I came from Chad. I speak multiple languages, but, you know, I didn't memorize, you know, my social and some of those things. And so while we were doing drills, you know, I was always late or, or, or slow to come back to the tow line. With that, my recruit division commanders thought I was gonna be, well, the first three weeks, it wasn't until I went back to be a recruit division commander myself that I realized that the first three weeks are not an assessment mode. So that's when they weed out those recruits that at the time, the recruits that were not gonna make the cut or the ones that were gonna slow the division down. So one, one weekend I was listening to my division commanders and they, we were shining shoes on a Sunday and they said, and oh, by the way, they never called me Seaman Recruit McBride or anything. They called me it. So I heard them say, it is not going to make it. Man, it did something to me. Because, and even like now, when I talk about it, I get goosebumps because I feel like, how can you discard me? And you don't even know me. You didn't even, you know, so, and they used to call me stupid, retarded, slow, all of those things. But it wasn't because I was any of those things. It's just because it took me a little bit to translate all of that stuff because I just, you know, came um, moved fully to the United States. So um, when I went to my first command, my senior chief kind of lit that fire in me to continue to stay in the Navy. But long story short, when I fast, that's to me, when leadership doesn't have the patience to lead, good sailors go home that you never even knew about. So I felt like how many Samiras went home because leaders, leaders didn't have the patience to lead, you know, because I almost went home for nothing. And the way I, I passed boot camp was there was a recruit who was doing everything right. And that's who I observed because I needed to move faster, right? So that's who I observed and that's how I passed boot camp. And my Navy ball cap means, I mean, everything to me. I still have it to this day. Not the Master Chief hat, not nothing. The, my Navy recruit ball cap. So long story short, when I went back as a recruit division commander, I, I realized that a high percentage of my recruits were coming from places where they were told they were not gonna amount to anything. I wasn't like that on the front end. Before I, was a, before I got there and met that experience, my leadership, they just drove me, right? So I just knew how to drive, drive. I wasn't relating to people to even ask questions. I just wanted you to get the job done. But on the flip side, when I went back to, uh, to be an RDC, I realized that some of them would clinch, some of them would, you know, would not want, you know, they were scared and all of this. I'm like, why? What is the experience? And so when you call them in and you talk to them, they're crying and some of them are six foot, whatever. They don't look weak, but there is a scar that we are touching that they don't want to, they don't, it doesn't want to be touched. So most of them come from broken homes, from areas where they were told you're not going to amount to anything. And they're coming to us to find belonging, to be somebody. So when I went back out, I realized that that's what's in my chief's mess. That's what's in the wardroom. That's what's walking my deck plates. And so it changed my whole way of leading because I needed to connect with them first. Because when I say, hey, sailor, what's going on with you? I may be the first person to ever ask them, how are you? Some of them. And it changed everything about leadership and my purpose about people once I recognized that. So no matter how high I went, I really came back down to let me talk to you. So the counseling, the, the intentional, you know, um, conversations, the, hey, I see, are you okay today? But really, are you okay? Not just because I want to do it in passing. And then they recognize that you care. And the care may be tough love. It's not always going to be, hey, here you go. You're going to get what you want. But at least we're talking to you. And I make that the, the first thing. Every chief's mess I go to, I don't care what their priorities are. But priority number one is you're going to make time for your sailor. So when they say, hey, chief, hey, sir, it better be music to your, to your ears because they didn't have to call you. They didn't have to talk to you. And they did. So make the time. And, and the return on investment is so much more for that little bit of second that I, we gave them. So I make it intentional to make ourselves available to talk to them and to get them the resources, especially in today's world, to get them the resources they need. Because if I could get you to the resource early enough, 
I can get you back longer than if I if I withhold it, then you they get out or they're gone. And that's a, that's a talent that I missed out on. And I had a hand in that. So the same way I've had great people keep me in this Navy. Right. I want I don't want to be the reason why sailors go home and I don't want anyone in my leadership circle at any command to be the reason why people are going home. We should be the reason why they want to continue to serve. And if they want to go home, it better be on their terms and let's still support them transition to where they can continue to have a good life because it's, uh, to me, I take it, it's that much more important than just sailor to leadership and do what we want in the Navy. We're growing people, we're growing characters. So that it's, it's deep for me. So I, it kind of was long, but I hope it answered the question. No, it did. I appreciate it. I think more organizations need to uh, spend time with the younger, because they they are the future, right? Um, and and I think they neglect that, and they 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 spend time maybe at the more senior levels, and it it, it that that's a short term answer or short term solution than and then strategically going after the younger uh, leaders. That's just my opinion. So thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I'm gonna um. I I got chills too. I could see your chills. I was getting chills too from your story, Samira. My goodness. Um. Wow. I'm going to throw a question at you about that interaction. I, I had a lunch yesterday with a chaplain who just came off the Harry S. Truman. Um, and I was like, hey, what are sailors complaining about? Like, what, what's going on? And, you know, and the Harry S. Truman, like, how, how are things on the ship? And um, one of the things he said was how, how hard it was for sailors to talk to each other, like, even to him. I mean, just there, anybody I think he was referring to in general was um, people's hold a conversation that was his phrase they have a whole time hard time holding a conversation and he said you know they're used to his assessment was they're used to um you know ending a conversation because they're all digital they're like you know they don't have these hard conversations so um if i am to understand you correctly uh what i would be encouraged to do is to go out and talk to sailors more right um and my question to you is how is that working for you are we fine are you finding that sailors are having are they are they just coming up and telling you their problems or is there something more you have to do today because we're used to having conversations by text no they'll, they'll talk it's just you know be be the title messes it up sometimes because it's not that the sailors don't want to talk to you it's being at you know at the cmc level Everybody in between who's leading them is who is more excited when they see the sailor talking to you, which is why I say, if you do your part, we don't have, it doesn't have to be in, in my office, but everybody likes the conversation. Um, and it's almost, I think it's the other way when I, I almost have to keep massaging it for them to feel, finally say, okay, I can talk to this person because you're right. I can call a sailor they won't answer the phone. But if I yeah. text them, they'll hit me back with all of the emojis, just like that. Like, that's how they answer all of it. It's fine. That's how we want to communicate, so long as you got my point, right? But but um, there are certain things you cannot do over text or phone call. And if you have two conversations and they went well, they go back and they talk about it. And then that opens the door for the next one to want to come talk to you. So you just got to start with doing it right. and. Um, genuinely talking about whatever the issue is or just their well-being and if it goes well then they're gonna advocate it themselves the best ones that are gonna advocate for the next go talk to so-and-so go talk to so-and-so and then they'll flood you because everybody yeah. looking for that connection and that conversation and then when they walk away right then they feel like they were heard they may not get what they want but at least they felt like they were heard and that's yeah. that's like we want that you know, even as a CMC, if I go talk to anybody, I want to, I want to feel, you know, uh, worthy by the time I leave that you heard what I had to say and that we were able to have a decent conversation and I wasn't neglected and I don't feel um, not only let down, but I don't feel like you talked at me or down at me and I feel good about it when I walk. Everybody wants that. It's not just the junior people. So why is it hard for us to do it? It's the human nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, you'll see we're at time five four. I did this uh, in I was chatting with Vic, my uh, my my tech wizard helped me out make these tough decisions behind the scenes. But the conversation was just so great. I I just didn't think it was right to stop and do breakouts today. So sometimes that's what happens um, because the group conversation was so um, just hearty. And I see there are a lot of people who are writing in chat. So I know we won't be recording the chat part, but um, a lot of really good advice. Uh, Matt's putting some advice on there from Shell, uh, get to know you mentoring model. Um, and uh, Lori's talked a little bit here. Um, 
and they want to share before we uh, kind of wrap up to the hour. I, I see Laura, you've talked a little bit here. Um, if anything you want to share for those who are just going to be listening. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. I see uh, Angela Morales. Go ahead. You got your hand up. Um, yeah. Wow. Emily, this is fantastic. Mass Chief McBride. Um, unbelievable. Congratulations on all your successes. I retired in 2018. I missed the Navy every single day. <laughs> and uh, you took me right back there to the deck plates about uh, loving and take caring, taking care of that sailor. So everything you said was amazing. Uh, Emily, I will go on the record by saying I took more notes on this session than any other session. And um, right now I'm not working, but you just excited me to go out there and uh, be, that, be that leader, be that transparent leader who says good morning and looks people in the eye. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. It's so great. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be tearing by the time I leave. It's it's <laughs> I thought I was supposed to come inspired this way. It wasn't supposed to be the other way around. I got goosebumps, I'm warm inside. I don't know. I'm not <laughs> And that's the miracle of excellent leadership is that you go out there trying to inspire others. And what you find is that you get inspired yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's just awesome. Um all right, I'm going to leave it over to you to round us out. If you have any uh, anything you want to take us to the top of the hour or just any, any class reflections, Samira. I'm overwhelmed, um, you know, with uh, with emotions. And I just think that I, I want to say thank you to you for, again, for giving us this platform and bringing us together for the conversation because um, there's not a lot of it happening. And, you know, what you're doing is, is challenging, I'm sure, but at least you're out here trailblazing it and, and making it happen and getting us together. Um, I really, I commend you for that. And if there's anything I can do to help help support, um, I'm only a phone call away. Um, and to everybody who listened, thank you for just um, bringing great value to the call and finding you know, once she put out there is some Samira McBride that's gonna come talk to you all that you took the time to come listen. Um, but in return, I'm walking away with my heart is filled and, and it's validated that we're doing this for, for the right reasons. And um, the same way, you know, you may have came to get inspired, I'm inspired to do more by the time I get off, you know, and maybe tomorrow go do something because I'm on maternity leave right now. I may just go back to work early, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> Um, but that definitely th th thank you. Thank you for that. And I thought it was so good that my CEO was able to be here. It just it, it made it so much more relevant to put the two stories together. Um, and the EXO, I talked to him right before I got on to get his perspective on, you know, why, why in command, right? Why do we choose to, to do this job? But in anything we do, so long as you're doing it um, with an open heart and you're willing to to grow others, then life is good because selfless leadership is something that's priceless. And the return on investment, you're gonna feed off of for a lifetime. So thank you for, for logging on and I don't have anything else to add. Samira, are you familiar with uh, SSLA? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. If, if you want another channel for your amazing leadership power, <laughs> And more time to spend with Emily, who's the president of SSLA. Sign right up. <laughs> well, there you go. There's your plug. All right. Okay, I'm going to sign off. But the 17 people on this call, they're the luckiest 17 people on the planet this Friday because oh, you made it so, uh, Master Chief. Thanks so much. I'm humbled. All right. Thank you. I, I am.